Hey, I'm Grant and welcome to Second Plate, a show where we focus on reusing ingredients from other recipes and using things that you might just have around your house to make some meals that you wouldn't think of as being possible, but totally are. So based off the of last episode, we still have a ton of potatoes I want to use up and I want to go again for another breakfast theme for this one. So today we're going to be making a boxty, which is a Irish potato pancake. It's basically somewhere between a hash brown and a potato, depending on how you personally want to make it, but it's a great way to throw stuff in and even though like traditionally they're just potatoes, I think it's kind of fun to throw in whatever I have on hand to just make little ones and they're super fun to serve and super interesting and I think it's a great thing to have on the show. What I've started with so far is I have three russet potatoes currently boiling. I'm essentially making mashed potatoes in this pot. It's chicken stock or chicken broth, if you want to use that and I've just diced them up and I've salted them already. And I'm gonna have these cooking in the background for about 10 minutes because I want them nice and mushy. Now, I call out the number very specifically because I want to have the same or more for my personal version of this recipe of these other potatoes that I'm actually gonna grate. And this is kind of important right from the beginning is how you want them. The more mashed potatoes I have in this recipe, the more it's gonna be like a pancake because that, it's a lot more liquidy, more like batter. And the more of the shredded potatoes, the more I have a hash brown or it's basically a grilled potato wedge. That's more of how I personally like it, so I think it's important to have more of these than the ones I'm mashing. But I wanted to call that out and just make sure that you know it's just gonna cook right over there in, on the side. Plus it's nice to just kinda toss that on before you even get started and you'll be done by the time you get out. So I'm gonna start again with three potatoes. I am gonna be grating these. So I'm just gonna start with getting the skin off. I I am personally a fan of the Y peeler. That's what this is specifically. You can also get the alternate one where it's more of a pen. And either one works. I think it's something where in an ideal world I would like both. But I feel like this just makes a nice better angle. Although I believe it's probably a little bit easier to avoid your cutting yourself or say getting in at odd angles if you have the pen. Whereas this is for if you want to do a lot really quickly. And one thing I thought was just kind of neat, because I never really used a peeler before, I would just use like a knife, is what these peelers have in addition to the blade is, you'll notice that there's one actually end of this that's higher up, and that's entirely intentional. That's for digging out the uh, eyes of the potato. So if I say I wanted to get this eye out of the potato, and I want to do it with a wide peeler, I would have to just constantly keep digging at it, and you lose more and more of the potato. And the name of the game with peeling potatoes is get as much potato and get off all the skin without digging in too much. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get a good angle. And I just use my other thumb and I just dig in with it. It can just kind of scoop them out like that. It was something where I was staring at this, prepping for the recipe, I'm like, there's gotta be a reason. There's gotta be a reason. And whenever I come across stuff like that when I'm cooking, where there's clearly a reason, I always make a point to look it up because cooking's the kind of thing where it's been around for so long there's a reason for why everything is the way it is. Not that you can't get creative or do that with a pen knife, I'm sure, but I do try to, when I sit down and I make a recipe, and even if I'm doing something simple, like I don't know how many times I've carved potatoes for this show at this point, I am gonna kinda sit down like, okay, what's the ideal way? Like, what's the right way to carve a potato and like skin it? And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm doing it. Or, or maybe I don't realize that there really is like a pretty good nice strategy that I wasn't aware of. Again, to cut these, I like to just split them in half. I get right up on the knife. I get pretty good angle and I just make sure that my tip is planted and then I just slice through and that gives me my halves. Then I go ahead and make strips. <laughs> or actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. I've just been cutting a bunch of these for that pot over there. So let me go ahead and just so I can show that what I did. Let me just dice these. So like I said, I do strips all the way through. I like to make sure I keep the potato itself together, because then I can just go through like so. Then just go get the back of the knife blade, scoop it in, and I'm just gonna toss these in the pot with the rest, which look like they're going pretty well. Again, making a point not to cover it entirely, that's just something I personally like, so I can hear it, I can see how much steam's coming out. If it's sealed, you might have the situation where it's actually underboiling because you turned it down and then you don't realize it's not a rolling boil like you wanted. And it's just something that's kind of a, just a nice little thing, but you know, do whatever you want in your kitchen, you know your own stove. Then over here I have just a grater, 
You could use it for cheese. I used it mainly for potatoes. It's got a bunch of different settings for whatever you're going to use. But I personally, I'm just going to use the largest here. And I have this little insert. This is actually part of it. It looks like it's just there to, I guess, fill stuff. But I'm actually going to use it to collect. So I'm just going to take a potato. I have peeled like so. And I'm just going to grate it up and down like this. I will say, as I do this, using just like really good strokes, because I don't want to drive my hand into this cheese grater. That's not fun is I try to do this after that's been going for a while. Because if you ever worked with potatoes and you haven't cooked them right away, they turn that kind of brownish orange. And I want to minimize that as much as possible. Cool. I'm just going to get down as close as I think is safe. It's not a big deal. And I'll usually just end up with this husk, and this is perfect to just like throw it in. I don't want to throw off my uh, balance, so I'm not going to use too much. I'm going to keep this to the side because I've never been able to massively get it all in the grater, but I can still use this. And I just got to prep the rest of my potatoes. So uh, I believe, again, the origin of this dish is it's actually an Irish thing, and it's a very traditional recipe. And like a lot of those, what's really nice is it's super flexible because this wasn't necessarily designed for flavor. Like, it's pretty good, and it's essentially a comfort food. But it was a recipe that you could you know, make work no matter how many potatoes you had. You could throw other stuff in. You could say use butter. You could use salt. Very simple staples and make something good out of it. Looks like I got a little bit of a bad spot in potato. I'm just going to, actually I'll leave that on so I have somewhere to hold on when I grate. Just kind of thinking ahead here. The idea of grating a potato, I think what I, <laughs> I started practicing I think about a week and a half ago, and my girlfriend came in and saw me just grating this potato, and I'm sure it looked extremely weird at the time, because it's not something I think a normal person would have expected to walk in on, it's just me going to town with a potato on a cheese grater. I don't even think she knew I had a cheese grater, because I never grate cheese, but uh, I think they're neat. So I bought one one time, I was like, I'm going to grate something, I'm going to get fancy and I'll grate cheese every time I use it, and sadly, no. But uh, I want to learn more about it because it's definitely where, it's one of the cool things where you can expand, I think, into more and more interesting ingredients where when you're starting off, like I pretty much was, you know, there's nothing wrong with just getting pre-shredded cheese, but I can easily see where if I wanted to really, you know, get into a meal, I'm like, no, I'm going to get this really nice cheese. I'm going to freshly grate it myself. I'm going to grind all the pepper and it just, it's there if you want it. You know, you can just have it around. I think I've said before on the show, I'm a huge fan of kitchen gadgets. That's, I suppose, a weakness because I have a small kitchen. I just live in an apartment and I have limited counter space. So to have basically half of, maybe a quarter of my oven's drawer taken up by this thing, you gotta weigh the pros and cons. Or like, I, I would love to have both kinds of potato peelers, but realistically, you don't need it. It's just a little bit more convenient. And I think that's how, as I've been getting more into cooking and trying different things, I have strategized about what I get and what I wait on. So I'm going to get this eye out. The digging the eyes out thing, that's just really interesting to me. Because it's just like, oh, it's so simple. But I, I never would have done it. I, I must have lost so much potato to that simple little thing because I have to carve it out with a big hunk of a slice when I could just like nicely gouge it out. It's very simple. Okay. Then I'm just going to go shred these down. It goes pretty quick. It's basically one of those things where the more you practice it, the faster you can go. Like if you want, I'm pretty sure you're going to shred through potatoes. And I wouldn't be surprised. You could probably run it through like a food processor or something as well. But I just want to be careful that I don't want to just drag my knuckles down across this. Because that's not particularly fun either. Okay. Get this one. It seems also like the natural thing this lends itself to would be to cook this for kids. And I could easily see where if you have a kid who's a little bit older, this is the job you give to them. You know, it's not quite where you're giving them a huge chef knife. But at the same time, there's like here where like, I don't know, an oven mitt and just kind of go to town because I could see them really liking it having fun and then they get to say they helped to make it and then you can gradually have them transition in whereas maybe you don't want to say 
give them full access to knives and a frying pan just yet. Cool. I'm going to get that hunk out. And you can already see with some of the ones before how it's turning red just from, I guess it's just oxi like oxidization. And it's not an issue. It's just something to kind of be aware of. That you don't want to do this and then throw stuff on the pot to boil. Cool. So now I'm just going to go ahead and take a nice little rubber spatula and I'm just going to run it up against this. It's not a big deal if there's anything in there. You don't really need to get every single drip of potato. This is more of like how you clean it. But then I'm just going to lift this off and then we have our shredded potatoes. I'm not a huge fan of my dishwasher at my apartment because it's pretty bad. But the grater is one of the things where as soon as I use it, that's going in. I don't want to deal with that. So don't feel lazy if you uh, don't want to mess with that. So I'm going to take this bowl here and I'm going to gather my potatoes because what I need to do next is I need to drain this of water. It's nothing crazy. I don't need to throw it on, say, a grill or anything. I'm just going to get this. It almost looks like, I don't know, like coleslaw or sauerkraut. And I just have a potato masher I'm going to be using again in here in a second. And I'm just going to kind of mash this down and squeeze it out. I don't want to literally mash this. That's not what I want. But I basically just want to squeeze out all the water I can. Let me just get a bowl here. Because I want this to hold its general shape. If I can get this. But all the mashness of the potatoes is going to come from those. So usually I like to do one when I finish kind of grinding them. And then I'll let it sit and then somehow way more water is going to come out of these. Cool. So I'll let this sit for just a brief minute while I talk about some of the ingredients. Like all potato dishes, you're going to want to use a fair amount of fat, particularly butter. However, I'm also going to be grilling these with some bacon grease I have from a previous show. It will usually form up to be kind of a congealed mass and you just throw it on the grill and it'll melt. I'll also be cooking the other half in actual butter so you can see the difference. It's not something you want to skimp on because it's where the flavor comes from and you need it to be, to really soak up in the potatoes because that's where the frying comes from. Otherwise, I'm going to be adding just a little bit of cheese, particularly towards the end, just to give it a little bit more of a creaminess. And I have some green onions that I have left over from a previous show just to give it a little bit more flavor. Like I think traditionally I've always heard based off all these recipes I've researched for the show that generally it's just raw potatoes that you work with this and then creams and stuff like that. But uh, I figured onions, that's a nice, pretty good thing. I'd also like to try mushrooms, like anything you would think to put with potatoes in like kind of like a breakfast, like hash meal. That's uh, what I think would be good with these. But you just want to make sure you don't compromise the integrity of it. Because as you'll see, the reason you grate this instead of, say, chopping it is this is essentially the thread that's going to hold the much looser batter together. And if I put in too much like this, it will work. But then it turns just into fried hash browns instead of a nice patty. Because I don't want to ruin the integrity of the patty for this. Otherwise, to make up our batter, I have flour and I have buttermilk. So you can substitute, I believe, actually cream for this or just regular milk. It's again where if you want it to be a little bit lighter, don't put as much in. If you want it to be super comfort food, just go to town. You can always cook off any extra. It's not a big deal. So I'm going to go and check on my potatoes. Like I said, what I'm basically making is mashed potatoes here. So I want to just kind of occasionally fish these out and just do a little test. Like I, I want to be able to easily cut through them. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So now what I'm going to do is I am going to fish these out with a ladle, strain them so I get down to just the potatoes, and then I'm going to mash those, mix them all together in a bowl with the rest, and then that's going to make my actual batter. I just move this over here. 
Ideally, I would have a strainer, and that's the easiest way, but I've definitely learned from cooking in college that sometimes you just have to get creative and make do, because you don't always have a sink on the hand, or maybe you have only one literal pan, and you've got to be able to drain it and then <laughs> clean the pan so you can use it for something else in the same meal. So I'm just going to slowly fish this out. I think it's just a nice thing to call out, because I know like, I would literally follow stuff for this dish, and you'd see someone cooking it, and they have, say, a massive griddle in their home. Of just, it's a slab of iron, and they just throw stuff on there. And it's like, that's cool, and that's, I'm sure that makes an amazing meal. But realistically, I have a skillet, maybe, if I'm in college, and that's it. And that's actually a true story. There's a lot of times when I would go to cook where all I had was a single hot plate, not unlike these, and that was it. And maybe, I think, way one skillet to go with it. So you just learn to kind of make do with what you need at that time. Cool. So I'm just going to let that kind of boil down a little bit. Perfect. And it's OK if I don't get all the potatoes, because again, I don't want this potato mash to overpower the consistency of that. So I'm actually, a lot of times, I want to go not exactly one to one on the potatoes. I want to go more like 1.2 of the shredded potatoes to that. So let me just get in here and grab this out. Okay, and then I'm going to drain this into my main bowl. By far the thing I forget the most is just like the mix it all together bowl. We have that, and you can start to see why I don't want to put, or rather I want to drain out all the water from these, because you're still going to get a bunch in there. So I just want to do another pass with this, where I just go in. I like to just kind of scoop it to one side, and you can kind of see a little bit of runoff. These are fairly dry, but yeah, there we go. You can start to see more of it again. So I'm just going to just get that kind of out. It's no big deal, it's just something where it gets better the more you go with it and you can see how much water you can get away with. Because again, like a lot of traditional recipes, really you just kind of wing it on all of these. And you're like, you know what? I want more salt, more pepper. I want more potatoes, less potatoes. Oh, I want a ton of cheese. So I'm just going to go around and mash this. I have a masher, but uh, personally, I've definitely used a wisp, whisk. But really, it's... It's hard to justify getting a potato masher because it's the kind of thing literally any other kitchen device can do. Cool. Gonna just scoop, scoop this down. Going to then add in these potatoes. Add in a couple of these. The cheese. And actually, give me one second where I put. I want an egg in here as well, now that I just recall that. So I'm going to go take this side little one, crack it in there. And I forgot to mention that one thing that's nice is, again, all these are optional. You don't necessarily need buttermilk, but it helps. And you know, I don't need this egg, but it's just a nice little consistency thing. It's definitely not my cooking if I don't have to get creative because I forgot something at the last minute. Which is why I think I like recipes like where I can just throw that off and it just kind of cooks in the background. Cool. Gonna give me my egg and then I'm gonna add buttermilk. And this is something, again, I haven't called out the exact amounts for. The way I've seemingly learned it is I basically wanna add as many dry ingredients like the flour as I add the other, like the milk and the buttermilk. So if I add about a half a cup of buttermilk, I want to add about half a cup of the flour. And this should begin to start looking more like batter before we're going to then go pop this on that little griddle and grill it. This is something I've kind of gone back and forth with on what I like. 
sometimes I'm like, you know what? I really did like how it was when it came out as like, like batter, like cake batter or pancake batter. And you get the really nice fitting shapes. Like I almost thought like, man, if you could get the recipe just right, you could just throw them all in say a cupcake pan and that would be super easy and convenient. It's beginning to look like a little cheesy ha casserole. And other times like, no, I really want those shredded potatoes. That's what really kind of defines it. Cool. So now I'm just going to ladle up some of this, grab some grease, and I'm going to put this on there. Let's see if I get a good spoon. Good spoon. So this is just some leftover bacon grease from a previous show. And put this on, kind of smear around so we have our example. It's a little off-putting at first, but after a while, once it kind of uncongeals, goes back down to a liquid, melts, I should say, that's the easy word for that, that's when it's going to be more like you'd expect. And then I'm going to use the classic part, the butter, making sure I have enough to actually get it to fry. And I just have this pan. I want it to be hot enough that this butter starts melting right away but it doesn't boil off. And particularly, I want it to smoke, but I don't want it to turn super brown. So I'm just gonna get the other side like so. I know what's the biggest thing I liked in seeing different kind of cookbooks and stuff like that is when they show comparisons. And that was the inspiration for this. I wanna be like, no, look, I can throw one on, on the bacon grease. So you can sh see how you use it alongside, say, some of the butter. So I'm gonna turn this up now that that's kind of going. Like I said, the more butter you add in, the more comfort food it is and the more tasty. But uh, you do need to make sure you have enough where it still fries. So let's turn that up. That one's a little big. Looks like I got a fair bit of water in these, so they might take just a little bit longer. But ideally, I just want to get a nice little patty and kind of spread it down. It's like you want something that's thick, because it is supposed to be like a pancake or like a patty. But you also don't want it to take a extremely long time to cook. You can even hear, hopefully, over the mic how the bacon one begins to fry up a lot sooner. Because this will give, I think the bacon grease gives a lot more of a, a thin, crunchy layer, whereas the butter goes inside. You get really deep brown cook. Let me just drain. And this is one of the good recipes where you can kind of get creative. And like, I'm going to see, like, let me drain out a little bit and just cook these. And these will cook, it really depends on how you end up making them. Like I think the cheese as it melts in is going to be affecting the cooking time. But I said for potatoes is something I'm just not good with. So I want to make sure I give them plenty of time because I worked in a, a kind of like, I guess a short order kitchen for a while. And the biggest thing that Chef Cook always said with potatoes is just don't touch them. Just leave them alone. Like French fries, if you're just constantly messing with them, you're going to mess them up. Hash browns, just let them cook. Don't constantly keep flipping them. Don't be like, I need more butter. Just let them go. And what's also kind of nice about this is really, I don't think there's any way to mess that up other than don't let them cook long enough or maybe don't put enough butter on because now you can hear them sizzling. Because ultimately, if, say, some of these fall apart and just have an issue, then it's just going to end up being a hash brown. So we're going to wait here, maybe give it about maybe three minutes as they kind of fry up. And once they're brown on one side and kind of start to hold their form, I'm going to try and flip them. It looks like I'll probably have to cut this one in half as it kind of congeals. Cool. So I'm just going to kind of keep peeking here occasionally. I'm looking for just a little bit of brownness underneath it. It's very similar to making a pancake, except you don't have all the exact clues like you would. So I'm just going to kind of get there and flip it. And again, these are a little mushy, so it's going to look more like a, a pancake than a hash brown. But it looks like they're all kind of coming. Interestingly, one of the other nice things about this is if you have a waffle maker, you can make these super fast and easily. I personally don't, but that seems to be like the perfect case. So we get under this. Just I like to edge around, make sure I'm not tearing at the center because I'm terrible and all my pans are sticky. Looks pretty good. And let's get this bacon one. Yeah, you can see how like this one's a little bit crispier when I use the bacon. Whereas these, when you actually bite into them, it's going to be less of a crunch and more just like a richness of flavor. So it's potatoes, so I'm going to add a fair bit of salt. I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I like really large 
chunks of salt. That's why I love this one, because it's not quite table salt, but it's not exactly kosher salt either. It's just a good mix where you can really taste it. I'm thinking next time I'm going to go cheese more at the end, because I think that's where a lot of that extra stuff comes as well. That, not exactly water, but the liquid, I guess you'd call it. But then you can also put plenty of stuff on this. I'm not really sure what to recommend most, because I like stuff inside these, because it's basically a hash brown. But I'd say you could get probably interesting, maybe ketchup. I'd say mainly salt. Cheese is the easy one to make like a cheesy hash brown. Cool, it looks like these are almost done. Generally, you cook about an 80% on one side, I don't know, maybe two minutes on the other. I've heard plenty of people mention that what they'll often do is you just have a whole big bowl of batter, and you just get a really hot griddle. You throw them on, and as they come off, you'll just set your oven to, say, like 200 degrees, because you want them to be served surprisingly hot, like just off the griddle. That's how they're meant to be consumed, not stuck in, stick them on a plate, and then everyone comes down 10 minutes later and then eats cold bo boxes. It's meant to be kind of together. So just keep kind of flipping. And the other thing to consider is I don't want this to be a true hash brown where it's cooked all the way through. What I'm exactly going for is a crisp outside. But when I cut into it, I still want it to be soft. So it's not like a pancake, exactly. You want it to be kind of still soft on the inside like that so that when you eat it, it's, it's like this mushiness. Because it's not batter. It's still a potato. But it's kind of important to understanding how you want to cook it. And that's why you can't say just fry them entirely in oil. So it's going to kind of bite into this because that's the best way to see. It's pretty good. It's both, looks like they're pretty much done. So I'm just going to go ahead and fish these off. There we go. Cool. And arrange them on my plate. And this would be something you don't make as a standalone meal. This is just naturally where, wherever you would normally put potatoes in a breakfast meal. Or honestly, I have a theory that I bet if I get this really crisp and made, maybe put some more cheese in it, I bet it would be kind of good on a burger as well if you get kind of neat and creative. But we have our boxes, and you could easily throw those together with some eggs, some sausage, anything else you would eat breakfast with. And it's a pretty fun recipe to throw together that is kind of more than the sum of its parts.